Alrighty, just one second and we're ready to go. Okay, I believe we are ready. We're on Facebook, everything is set. And here I am. Okay. Welcome to the evening Nectar of Devotion class. And today we're going to be starting with chapter 6 in the Nectar of Devotion, which is how to discharge devotional service. And it's going to be a little more specifics than the last few classes. Okay, so first we'll chant Jai Radha Madhava. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Gopi Jana Malaba Giri Bada Gopi Jana Malaba Giri Bada Dhaguti Yashoda Nandana Mrajajana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Mrajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Gopi Jana Malaba Kiri Bada Gopi Jana Malaba Giri Bada Dhaudi Yashoda Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Radha Oh, ba, kunya bihari, jaya radhan, oh, madhuva, kunya bihari, jaya om vishnupad, paramahansa paradigacharya, old sotetta, Satashi Shimad, His Divine Grace, Divine Chakna, Bhaktivedanta, Goswami, Shila Prabhupada Kijai, Iskan, Founder Acharya, Shila Prabhupada Kijai, Ananta Goti, Vaishna, Dhumma Kijai, Namacharya, Shila Prabhupada Kijai, Shila Prabhupada Kijai, Friends say, Kaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Babu Dichananda, Shitwe, Digadatha, Shila Sri Gaur, Bhaktivedanta Kijai, Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopi Govardhan Shain Pindara Kurda Kiri Govardhan Kijai Vrindavanam Kijai Majuram Kijai Jagadabhasami Kijai Manamai Kijai Shimani Lassi Devi Kijai Samaveda Vakka Vrind Kijai Gaur Gurdananda Hari Hari Gaur All glories the assembled devotees All glories the assembled devotees All glories the assembled devotees all glories to Shri Guru and Gauranga, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Mahum Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya Bhutale, Shri Madhya Bhakti Pananda Swami, Namaste, Namaste, Saraswati, Devi, Gaurabhati, Padani, Devasheshya, Srinivari, Pashtyacha, Teja Tarni. So, Omagana, Timiranda Shah, Gananjana, Shlakaya, Chakshura, Meditam, Yena, Tasmai, Shri Gurave Maha. So I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my divine spiritual master, 
Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge, while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, now we're going to continue with the nectar of devotion. But before we continue, we always chant this prayer to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, written by Srinivas Acharya. Anana Shastra Vichara Nekanipano Sadharma Samstapaka Ho Lokanam Hitakara Neu Tribuane Manyo Sharanya Karo Radha Krishna Padara Vinda Pashadha Nantena Matali Ko Bande Rupa Sanatano Raguyago Shi Jiva Gopala Ko And the translation is I offer my respectful obeisances unto the six Goswamis. Uh, namely, Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus they are honored all over the three worlds, and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in a transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. So now we'll go on to the Nectar of Devotion. And we're going to get into some of the details about the performance of devotional service right now. So here we go. Chapter 6. How to Discharge Devotional Service. So as we read through all these details that you can hear in this chapter, I don't want you to get or you all to get really nervous that you have to do everything. Uh, some of these details are details, and some of them are essential principles. And uh, Rupa Goswami uh, will make that very, very clear in this particular chapter. In fact, it's Srila Prabhupada commenting on Rupa Goswami, which will make it very clear. So chapter 6 is entitled, How to Discharge Devotional Service. Srila Rupa Goswami states that his elder brother, Sanatan Goswami, has compiled a Hari Bhakti Vilas for the guidance of the Vaishnavas, and therein has mentioned many rules and regulations to be followed by the Vaishnavas. Some of them are very important and prominent, and Srila Rupa Goswami will now mention these very important items for our benefit. The purport of this statement is that Srila Rupa Goswami proposes to mention only basic principles, not details. For example, a basic principle is that one has to accept a spiritual master. Exactly how one follows the instructions of the spiritual master is considered a detail. For example, if one is following the instruction of a spiritual master and that instruction is different from the instructions of another spiritual master, this is called detailed information, you know, not absolute principles. But the basic principle of acceptance of a spiritual master is good everywhere, although the details may be different. Srila Rupa Goswami does not wish to enter into details here, but wants to place before us only the principles. So he mentions the basic principles as follows. Okay. One, accepting the shelter of the lotus feet of a bona fide spiritual master. Two, becoming initiated by the spiritual master and learning how to discharge devotional service from him. Three, obeying the orders of the spiritual master with faith and devotion. Four, following in the footsteps of the great Acharya's teachers under the direction of the spiritual master. Five, inquiring from the spiritual master how to advance in Krishna consciousness. So this is essential principles right there. And so uh, the next principles are actually essential, uh, but they're not really on the same level as the initial five. But in any case, they are essential if you want become a pure devotee. Six, being prepared to give up anything material for the satisfaction of the Supreme Personality of God, Sri Krishna. This means that when we are engaged in devotional service of Krishna, we must be prepared to give up something which we may not like to give up, and also we have to accept something which we may not like to accept. And for me, that was waking up early in the morning, but now I like it. Uh, 
7. Residing in the sacred place of pilgrimage like Dwarka or Vrindavan. One can do that by making his home a place of pilgrimage. In other words, you have a nice little altar at home, you chant Hare Krishna at home, you have kirtan, you instruct your children and your wife or husband in Krishna consciousness. Eight, accepting only what is necessary or dealing with the material world only as far as necessary. Yes. Nine, observing the fasting day on a codice. And ten, worshiping sacred trees like the Bannon tree and actually Tulsi baby. These ten items are preliminary uh, necessities for beginning the discharge of devotional service and regular principles. In the beginning, if a neophyte devotee observes the above-mentioned ten principles, surely he will quickly make good advancement in Krishna consciousness. So, the next set of instructions, actually, I'm not just reading what Prabhupada said, the next set of instructions are actually based upon these preliminary ten principles. And actually, everything's based upon the five principles here, because if you do that, except the shelter of the spiritual mass, become initiated, by him, obey his orders and follow the great acharyas under his direction and inquire from the spiritual master how to advance in Krishna consciousness. Actually, everything else will be done automatically. But he'll instruct you how to do all those things. Hmm. So, uh, the next set of instructions is as follows. One should rigidly give up the company of non-devotees. That doesn't mean uh, to just like run away and not be friends with people who are not devotees. It's, it's a different thing. One should not, uh, let's say, have intimate friendships with those who are not Krishna conscious. Two, one should not instruct a person who is not desirous of accepting devotional service. Three, one should not be very enthusiastic about constructing costly temples or monasteries. And then we find Prabhupada was very enthusiastic about constructing costly temples and monasteries. So I'd say these are details, you know, sometimes they're described as principles, but they're bendable principles. For example, Prabhupada was very enthusiastic about constructing costly temples and monasteries to attract people to Krishna consciousness, not for the principle or not for the point of constructing costly temples and being able to brag about it, thinking that he had done it, but he was interested in strategy. You know, utility is the principle, as Srila Prabhupada said, the books are the basis. One should not try to read too many books, nor should one develop the idea of earning his livelihood by lecturing on or professionally reciting Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. That's a very important principle. One should not be neglectful in ordinary dealings, as Prabhupada said. His uh, followers should be ordinary, uh, should be ladies and gentlemen, perfect ladies and gentlemen. One should not be under the spell of lamentation and loss or jubilation and gain. And a lot of these principles uh, or these, uh, let's see, qualities occur as one advances in Krishna consciousness. One should not disrespect the demigods. One should not give unnecessary trouble to any loving entity, including an ant. Nine, one should carefully avoid the various offenses in chanting the holy name of the Lord or in worshiping the deity in the temple. Ten, one should be very intolerant towards the blasphemy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna or his devotees. I was just listening to a conversation that Prabhupada had with uh, Mr. Patel uh, when he was doing his morning walks in uh, Juhu as part of Bombay or Mumbai as it is known now. And Prabhupada would get very upset with him and in one discussion, like, he was saying, uh, basically, uh, Mr. Patel was actually making the point, we're all Krishna. And then he, he was even quoting from the Bhagavad Gita to justify that. Uh, you know, in the ninth chapter, Krishna is my Vitami Dham Sabam Jekadavyakta Vortine Matstani Sabam Vitami Dham Tejvabhastata. By me and my unmanifested form, I am spread everywhere. So, in, in other words, he was making that point. But then there's the, the other verse or two, which are Motstani Bhutani Bhutan Bhutta Brin, not to Bhutta Stoke. That actually, even though Krishna, Krishna is in everything or everything is in Krishna, Krishna is not in everything. You know. So in other words, Prabhupada gave the example 
a very intelligent example of the body. He says, the hand is part of the body, and it's not, but it is not the body. And you cannot interchange the function of the hand with the function of the mouth or the function of the eyes, even though it's part of the same body. So very interesting discussion Prabhupada had. But Prabhupada was extremely angry and he was chastising him. And Prabhupada even said, you talk, you have the habit of talking too much. And Mr. Patel said, no, but you're, I accept you as a guru. And Prabhupada said, if you accept me as a guru, you basically shut up and listen. He didn't use the word shut up. So Prabhupada really was like that when someone was blaspheming or uh, considering the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna to be one of the demigods or uh, all the demigods were equal or to consider all of our, ourselves to be Krishna or to be, consider that the ultimate realization of the absolute truth was impersonal, Prabhupada reacted like fire. Without following the above-mentioned ten principles, one cannot properly elevate himself to the platform of sadhana bhakti or devotional service and practice. Although Srila Rupa Goswami mentions 20 items and all of them are very important out of the 20, the first three, namely accepting the shelter of the bona fide spiritual master, taking the shake with them, and serving him with respect and reverence are most important. And the reason they're most important is because if you do that, the other ones will be accomplished. You'll be following the other injunctions. Why is that? Because the guru will tell you to do that. If you're serving him with respect and reverence, the spiritual master will instruct you about following the other practices. They all come. All these other practices actually come from accepting the shelter of the bona fide spiritual master, taking initiation from him, and serving him and following his instructions with respect and reverence. The next important items are as follows. One should decorate the body with tilak, which is the sign of the Vaishnavas. That's what I have on my part. The idea is that as soon as a person sees these marks on the body of the Vaishnava, he will immediately remember Krishna. Lord Chaitanya said that a Vaishnava is he who, when seen, reminds one of Krishna. Therefore, it is essential that a Vaishnava mark his body with tilak to remind others of Krishna. Now, the question may arise. What if you have to job? What if you have to go somewhere? somewhere? Dangerous. Let's see. If you're going into Pakistan right now, it's dangerous to wear a tilak. Probably they wouldn't even let you in the country. What do you do? In a situation like that, you can just use some water and mark the different parts of your body. It is. The mantras. Oh, are you sitting here? Okay. So that way, put it on T-Lock, but you won't be getting yourself. There's some leeway. JJ's coming. Two, in marking such T-Lock, Sometimes one may write Hare Krishna on the body, one may not, may or may not be. And this is my, see? Uh -oh, <laughs> In 600 feet, turn right on oh. oh. Road. I thought I muted everybody. Hold on a second, let me mute. Let me mute everybody again. Okay, I just muted everybody. Um... Sometimes one may write Hare Krishna on the body. You don't have to do that. Whoops. I just muted everybody. Can you still hear everybody? Whoop. Three, two, four. Okay. Why does it say the screen sharing is paused? That's strange. Anyway. It says, I'm getting a message up there. The screen sharing is paused. Let me just stop the share and go sharing again. And I'm getting this funny message from the people who are Zoomers. Okay. Let's go back. Yeah, okay. 
So uh, sometimes you may write Hare Krishna. You don't have to. Uh, third one, one should accept flowers and garlands that have been offered to the deity and the spiritual master and put them on one's body. Because when you wear the remnants of Krishna or the spiritual master, you make great spiritual advancement. Actually, you can use things that the spiritual master has used or Krishna has used, but there's one thing or several things that you cannot use or should not use that is, you should not use the shoes of the spiritual master, at least on your own feet. You can put them on your altar. You should not use the shoes of Krishna. Put them on your altar. You should not use the sitting place of the spiritual master. It's too big to put on your altar. But anyway, so there's certain things that if the spiritual master has a certain special sitting place, like he has a rocking chair or something like that, other devotees shouldn't use it. The general Bhagavatam class... Uh, asana, that means seat, everyone uses. Because that doesn't pertain to an individual spiritual master. Anyway, other aspects or other items of the spiritual master one can utilize. Like if the spiritual master had an old bead bag, you could use that, or an old chatter, you could use that. Uh, one should learn to dance before the deity. Wow. Five, one should learn to bow down immediately upon seeing the deity of the spiritual master. Six, as soon as one visits the temple of Lord Krishna, one must stand up. Hmm. Hmm. Seven. When the deity is being born for a stroll in the street, a devotee should immediately follow the procession. In this connection, it may be noted that in India, especially in Vishnu temples, the system is that apart from the big deity, who is permanently situated in the main area of the temple, there's a set of smaller deities which are taken in procession in the evening. In some temples, there's the custom to hold a nice big procession in the evening with a band playing a nice big umbrella over the deities who sit on decorated thrones on a cart or palanquin, which is carried by devotees. The deities come out into the neighborhood and travel the neighborhood while the people of the neighborhood come out and offer prasad. The residents of the neighborhood all follow the procession, so it is a very nice scene. When the deity is coming out, the servitors in the temple put forward the daily accounts before them. So much was the collection, so much was the expenditure. The whole idea is that the deity is considered to be the proprietor of the whole establishment. And all the priests and other people taking care of the temple are considered to be servants of the deity. This system is very old and is still followed. So therefore, it is mentioned here that when the deity is on stroll, the people should follow behind. And actually, this is done in many, many temples. When I was in South India, in Sri Rangam, I happened to be present when they took the deity out. Now, in Sri Rangam, as Prabhupada mentions, they have a special deity, uh, which is called a festival deity, uh, Utsava Murti, that's a technical name, who is taken out once a day, and he goes to people's houses. And the way this deity is taken out is quite interesting. He's on a palanquin, and uh, this palanquin is supported by something like 20 or 30 different really strong men, because there's logs on either side of the palanquin. Like the, I said the log must be like at least one foot, actually more than that, at least one foot in diameter. And these big, strong men are, ca men are carrying the deity, and there's gongs going on and bands playing. And it's really an amazing sight, and everyone is following the deity. Even in our Vrindavan temple, and in some temples, some other temples too, and uh, actually many of the temples in India, Vrindavan and Mayapur, uh, that uh, before the Guru Puja, Guru Puja means the worship of Srila Prabhupada in the temple, uh, they take the deity, there's a deity of Prabhupada on the altar, and they take the deity off, and they allow Prabhupada in the deity form to take darshan, and then they circumambulate the temple, or maybe in Vrindavan is actually like the whole outside of the temple, and then they put that little deity on Prabhupada's Vyasa and have the uh, Guru Puja every day, and the devotees all follow. I remember, actually, when Prabhupada was present and I was in Mayapur, of course, they didn't put the deity or have the deity of Prabhupada when Prabhupada was present. But after taking darshan of the deities, in the morning when the curtains open, you know, what they call Govinda, 
or in Spanish we call it the aura, the Govinda, or in English we call it deity greeting. Anyway, so when the curtains opened, Prabhupada uh, greeted the deities, offered his obeisances, took darshan of the deities, took some charanamrita, and then he began to circumambulate the deities at least three times. As he was circumambulating the deities, he would be ringing the gong, and all of us would be following him and dancing and jumping around him. It was quite an amazing Quite an amazing experience and something that will remain firmly cemented in my consciousness forever and ever and ever. So this is a bona fide process that's done in many temples. Uh, eight, a devotee must visit a Vishnu temple at least once or twice every day, morning and evening. Uh, in Vrindavan, the system is followed very strictly. All the devotees in town go every morning and evening to visit different temples. Therefore, during these times, uh, there are considerable crowds all over the city. There are about 5,000 temples in Vrindavan. Of course, it's not possible to visit all the temples, but at least one dozen very big and important temples which were started by the Goswamis and which should be visited. Uh, interesting. So if you're not living close to a Vishnu temple, nowadays you can actually go online and take darshan of the deities every day and participate in the morning program, just like here. Every morning we have uh, different aspects of the morning program online. And when I give class, then the class is online, otherwise the class is on uh, Mayapur TV, the Hillsborough Temple, uh, Nubaloka Temple. So every morning it's like that. Or you have a little temple in your home, and you have a Bhagavatam reading every morning, and you take darshan of the deities in your home. Nine, one must circumambulate the temple at least three times. In every temple there's an arrangement to go around the temple at least three times. Some devotees go around more than three times, ten times, fifteen times, according to their vows. And every morning, I wake up early, and before Mangalarti, I circumambulate the temple three times. Of course, that's considered like going to all the different pilgrim, pilgrim, pilgrimage places in the universe, if one circumambulates the deities at least three times. The Goswamis used to circumambulate Govardhan Hill, Wow. One should also circumambulate the whole Vrindavan area. Ten, one must worship the deity in the temple according to the regulated principles, offering arti and prasad, decorating the deity, etc. These things must be observed regularly. Just like in Nubaloka, we have very regulated deity worship, very punctual, actually to the second. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, when he was appointed as the magistrate in Jagannath Puri, arranged that the worship in the temple in Jagannath Puri would be extremely punctual. He supervised every aspect of the worship in the temple. In fact, he even caught one time the king of Puri, because in those days every part of India had a king. Uh, he caught the king of Puri uh, snatching the money that was meant for the deities. And in order to punish the king, he fined the king so that the king had to pay to offer to the deities more than 50 times a day. And so this king got really upset, thinking all my money is going to be gone very soon. And that was the idea, because he had taken it from the deities. And so what he did is he hired a lot of brahmanas to arrange for a sacrifice, to pray that in a month's time, Bhaktivinoda Thakur would die. So they did this whole sacrifice, with fire and Brahmins and everything like that, you know. Actually, any Brahmin who would participate in a fire sacrifice like that is not a Brahmin. He is a paid servant, which is one of the lower caste, shudra caste. Anyway, so after a month's time, Bhaktivinoda Thakur did not die. And what happened is the king's son died. So do not perform a sacrifice to kill a great Vaishnava because it will boomerang on you. Now, if you don't know what a boomerang is, something they have in Australia, you throw and it comes back to you. Okay? So one must render personal service to the deities. Even queen of the temple is person, personal service. One must sing. Uh, that means chanting the holy names. One must perform sankirtan, same thing. One must chant. One must offer prayers. And we do that every morning. We include Vashtika prayer. 16, one must recite notable prayers. We do that. Some of these are repetitive. One must taste Mahaprasad, food from the very plate offered 
before the deities. Uh, one must drink charanamrita, water from the bathing of the deities, which is offered to guests. Now, right now, because of the COVID thing, we don't really put the charanamrita out because it's very dangerous. Anyway, we have to protect people's health. I mean, even when we're uh, performing the arti, we don't blow the conch shell anymore. We just, like, hit the conch shell three times like that instead of blowing it because we don't want any sort of uh, contamination so that the virus will be passed from one devotee to another. Of course, we haven't had any incidents of virus in our temple right now, but we pray that it will not occur. One must smell the incense and flowers offered to the deity. So also we used to pass around the flower, but we don't do that anymore because if we did that, it's like passing around the virus or whatever bacteria someone would have. Uh, one must touch the lotus feet of the deity. That's if one's going on the altar. One must see the deity with great devotion. Yeah. I remember one time we had one devotee here who got so angry at the deity that she was looking at the deities with anger because the deities didn't dress the way that she wanted them to dress anyway. That is not devotional service. One must offer RT at different times. We do that with the deities. One must hear about the Lord in his pastimes. From Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and similar books, we do that. One must pray to the deity for his mercy. One should remember the deity. One should meditate upon the deity. One should render some voluntary service. One should think of the Lord as one's friend. Remember the Bhagavad Gita verse? Bhokturam jakatapasam sarva lokamaheshram suradam sarva bhutanam jatvamam shantim richati. That one should understand. Uh, Bhokturam Jagatapasam, the Lord is the enjoyer of all sacrifice. Sarva Loka Maheshram, he's the Lord of all worlds. Suradam Sarva, he's the friend of all living entities. Suradam Sarva Bhutanam, Gatwam Shantim Richard. If one thinks like that, one will always be peaceful, not disturbed by material disturbances. One should offer everything to the Lord. That does not mean that I go into the temple room, bring my computer. Uh, bring my clothes and everything. It means whatever you do, you understand Krishna is the owner of it and you use it in his service. As Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, Manasadeha keha yo kishor apilam tu yo parinami kishor. My mind, my body, my home, my wife, my family, everything is yours, Krishna. Ishavasham idam sadam yadim chara jagajam jagat tina tachena bhuni jidha magriha kasha svidana nasi sopanishad nasi sopanishad states that everything is owned and controlled by the Supreme Personality of God, and the Lord is just giving us whatever we have as our quota, and that quota is meant to be used for the owner. Okay, One should offer a favorite article, such as a food or garment. Now, that favorite article also has to be Krishna's favorite article. I mean, my favorite article is my computer, and I'm not going to put it on the altar, but I'm using it in Krishna's service. Or, let's see... What other favorite articles do I have? Maybe my car, I'm using it in Krishna service. So the devotees in the early days took this a little too literally that some of them had as their favorite article blue jeans, dungarees, you know, whatever you may call it. And they offered old blue jeans to the deities, thinking, that's my favorite article. <laughs> 31. One should take all kinds of risks and perform all endeavors for Krishna's benefit. In every condition, one should be a surrendered soul. So these are things that you achieve as you advance in devotional service. I mean, you say, well, I'm not following that one right now. Oh, I can't. That's all right. Just uh, don't fight against it, but, you know, it'll come eventually out of devotion, out of love, out of spontaneity. One should pour water on the Tulsi tree. We do that. One should regularly hear Srimad Bhagavatam and similar literature. One should live in a sacred place like Mathura, Vrindavan, or Dwarka. In other words, make one's home or temple a sacred place. One should offer service to Vaishnava devotees. Uh, one should arrange one's devotional service according to one's means. You know, if one's rich, then use that money in Krishna's service. If one doesn't have anything, then do whatever you have. Use whatever you have in Krishna's service. In the month of Kartik, October, November, actually that starts now at the end of October, 
this year because we have this extra leap month, month, one should make arrangements for special services. In other words, the special service we do generally during the month of Karti is that we chant a prayer called the Damodar Ashtaka prayer. That means the eight prayers in glorification of Lord Damodar. Damodar means Krishna was tied around his belly with a rope. And we offer a lamb to Krishna. You'll see, everybody will see this during the month of Karti, which is coming up right now when we're in Purushottam month. During Janmasami, the time of Krishna's appearance in this world, one should observe a special service. We always do that for you. One should do whatever is done with great care and devotion for the deity. One should relish the pleasure of Bhagavatam reading among the devotees and not among outsiders. And of course, for the purpose of bringing people to Krishna consciousness, we can bend this one a little bit. It's important. Although, uh, as far as the more... Um, advanced parts of the Bhagavatam, such as Krishna's Rasa Leela and relationships with the gopis, we should be very careful who is in the audience because they will misunderstand, misinterpret, and perhaps commit offenses. Uh, one should associate with devotees who are considered more advanced. That's true. You serve devotees who are considered more advanced. One also associates with devotees who are equally advanced. One also associates with devotees who are Less advanced, the less advanced devotees, we try to bring them up to a higher platform. Equally advanced, we make friendship with them, and more advanced, we serve. One should live in the jurisdiction of Mathura. That's the same thing as living in a holy place. You make your home a holy place. You chant Hare Krishna regularly, and you serve the Lord in that way. You offer prasadam on your altar. The deity is the king of your home. Now, the total regulator principles come to an aggregate that means combined number, of 64 items. As we have mentioned, the first are the primary 10 regulated principles, then come the secondary 10 regulated principles, and added to these are 44 other activities. So altogether, there are 64 items for discharging the regulated practice of devotional service. Out of these 64 items, five items, namely, worshipping the deity, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, associating among the devotees, Sankirtan and living in Mathura are very important. And none of these five was really important. Worshipping the deity. Now, if you are not in a temple, and even if you don't have like a three-dimensional deity in your home, you put a picture. Uh, I remember the first temple I joined, which was in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, we had a picture of Panchatattva. That means Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Nishinanda, Dwayta, Gadadhar, and Srivas. That's, you see that, the five personalities, Pancha, Tattva, that means the five principal personalities. We had a giant picture, and they were dancing on our altar, and I found it extremely ecstatic. I didn't feel that there was any difference between having like the three-dimensional deities, like you see, like Gornatai, and this picture. In fact, the picture really enlivened me. I remember to this day, just dancing in front of that picture because it was a dancing temple. Actually, we would dance so much in that temple. Nowadays, of course, it's hard to get people to dance. They're just like, somehow or other, they've gotten, anyway, genetically, they're not the same, the devotees. But anyway, in the beginning days, we would dance so enthusiastically, the windows in this old building where we had the temple used to change shape. I was afraid that sometimes the windows might break. You know, sometimes they become uh, uh, parallelograms instead of rectangles. You know, so I was just like, wow, look at this. The building is shaking. And we were jumping up and down in ecstasy. So anyway, so worshiping the deity, just have a picture. Krishna's there in his picture. Krishna's there in his holy name. Krishna's there if you have a three-dimensional deity of him. Uh, Krishna is there in the service. Krishna is there in the temple. So we're talking about deity. It's, it's any form, whether it's out of wood or on paper or a photograph, just like we have photographs here. Let me hear this. A cover, Nectar of Devotion. That's a deity. The book is a deity. Like that. You can actually worship the book. Like that. So... This is what it means to worship the deity. Hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is extremely important. 
Uh, Bhagavatam is a story about different devotees or different personalities that really brings you to the point of pure devotional service, especially if you read properly by the time you get to the 10th canto, which we are reading right now. Amazing. Uh, associating among the devotees or with the devotees. Sankirtan, which means chanting the Lord's holy names together. That means with other people or in a very absorbed, complete form. You're just being, you're having your mind completely absorbed in Krishna's name. And living in Mathura. It means wherever you live, it should be a holy place. Whether it's an apartment you've just rented, maybe even you're just living there by yourself. Just put pictures of Krishna up. Then your home is as good as Vrindavan, as good as Mathura. If your consciousness is there, there's a statement that one can travel at the speed of the mind by thinking of a particular place. If you think of a particular place, even though your physical gross body is in that in another place, you are traveling to that place. For example, right now, if I just close my eyes and I think of Hawaii and the surf, then that's what I'm just thinking, oh, the breeze and the mangoes and the papayas and the uh, avocados that are this big. Of course, I shouldn't think like that because that's maya. That's uh, one of the causes of anartha, attachment to things in the mode of goodness. Anyway, so, but if I think of Vrindavan right now, I think of Govardhan, right? especially I think of Govardhan Hill, in circumambulate, I can picture in my mind's eye the different parts of Govardhan, the tail of Govardhan, the city of Govardhan, Radhakund and Shamakund, then that's where I am. So actually, if your mind is there, that's where you are. You are living in Mathura. And the way you can have your mind be there is you surround yourself with pictures of Krishna in your house or pictures of Vrindavan in your house or different items of devotional service, and you have a little altar, you know, just a picture of Krishna, a picture of Panchatatwa, a picture of Radha and Krishna, a picture of whatever, and a picture of your spiritual master, smaller, of course, that has to be lower than the picture of Radha and Krishna or Panchatatwa, like that. So, anyway, if you follow those five, you'll be all right. And you follow the three beginning injunctions, which you're talking about, associate, uh, accepting the lotus feet of the spiritual master, accepting the initiation from him, and serving the spiritual master under his directions, then everything else comes clear. So you don't, you don't have to memorize these 64 items. Just know that, you know, accept the spiritual master, uh, accept initiation from him, accept shelter, accept initiation from him, and accept instruction from him. That's, those three things, if you do, everything else follows. Because then the spiritual master will tell you to worship the deity, to hear Shema Bhagavatam, associate with devotees, and make your home a holy place, and ch of course, chant the holy name, Sankirtan, okay? And Sankirtan means to chant the holy name, but it can be accompanied by any sort of instrument. You don't have to use specific instruments. I mean, sometimes people make propaganda that you have to only use cartels and redunga. Well, when Lord Chaitanya was present, there was statements there were horns there. Krishna, of course, is playing the flute. Of course, Krishna probably didn't go on Sankirtan except when he was with Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But he was doing Sankirtan. So devotees would use all sorts of instruments. Uh, it's not that we are precluded as long as the holy names are prominent. I remember one of my friends was told he could, couldn't play his trumpet anymore in Kirtan. And I was shocked because his trumpet was inspiring people. It's not that he gave up chanting. He was actually inspiring people to chant. So the point is, Balena Patichiyate. You judge something by the result. So by adding a particular musical instrument, as long as it doesn't overpower the holy names, because the holy names are the essence. It's not the instruments that are important. By adding a particular instrument, if, if you get more people to chant and be get people more absorbed in the chanting, then at that point, 
you're actually accomplishing your purpose. Absorb chanting, sankirtan, more people chanting. That's the point. Just like George Harrison, he had these different songs like, my sweet Lord, and so many people were chanting holy names, and Prabhupada encouraged them. Prabhupada didn't say, hey, shave your hair, Georgie. Move into the ashram and take initiation. And Prabhupada said, no, no, keep doing what you're doing, because George Harrison was singularly responsible for bringing so many people to Krishna consciousness through his music. So if you're a musician, use your musical ability in Krishna's service. If you're an artist, use your artistic ability in Krishna's service. But don't deviate. Like if you're an artist, uh, there's one story that uh, one devotee was painting a picture of Krishna, and he painted a Krishna like Rambo, you know, with muscles. And Prabhupada said, he's not like that. So you have to follow certain otherwise directions. Anyway, so remember five items, worship the deities, reside in a holy place like Madhur here, the Srimad Bhagavatam, associate with devotees, and uh, chant the holy names. Thank you, Tom. Okay, the 64 items of devotional service should include all our activities. Oops, I think we finished with the chapter. But maybe we'll finish early today because I want to just stick with one chapter. The 64 items of devotional service should include all of our activities of body, mind, and speech. As stated in the beginning, the regulated principle of devotional service enjoins that all of our senses must be employed in the service of the Lord. Exactly how they can be thus employed is described in the above 64 items. Now, Srila Rupa Goswami will give evidence from different scriptures supporting the authenticity of many of these points. So, anyway, just to, to clarify it, uh, if you are doing other activities other than these 64 that support the 64, that is the same thing. For example, if I'm working a job, which I'm not because I'm too old for that, I'm retired, retired sannyasi. If I was working a job and giving my money for book distribution or giving my money for uh, Sankirtan or for Shadam distribution or something like that, the job would follow fall under the uh, 64 items we just mentioned. Yes. So anything that supports these 64 not only the 64 items directly can be understood to be connected to Krishna. That's why we have that verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Vramarpanam Brahmaha Vir Brahmagno Brahmanam Tam Brahmathena Gantavya Brahma Karma Samadhinam. If you do something for Krishna, you're fully absorbed uh, in service to Krishna in this world, of course, under the instructions of Krishna's representative spiritual master. But regardless of what you're doing, then that activity is the same as a Vaishnava Brahmin throwing uh, ghee into the fire. In other words, by throwing the ghee into the fire and doing the swaha business, everything becomes spiritualized, the atmosphere becomes spiritualized, the fire becomes spiritualized, the people participating in the fire become spiritualized. So in the same way, if you offer your activities, the results of your activities, and you do it under the direction of Krishna's representative, then everything becomes spiritualized. You become spiritualized, the activity spiritualized, the result of the activity, people surrounding you become spiritualized and purified. A lot of spiritualized stuff there. Uh, then that's it. So when we talk about these 64 items, you know, expand on them and see how you are contributing to either yourself doing those things or contributing to someone else doing those things. You understand? If you bring some boga to the temple, you're contributing to the deity offering. If you bring some incense to the temple, you're contributing to the offering of incense and or flowers. I mean, flowers are very expensive. So bring them to the temple and give them to Krishna. So anyway, so Krishna consciousness is not precisely compact just within these 64 items but the expanded viewpoint of these 64 items. So on that happy note, tomorrow we will continue with chapter 7, which is entitled Evidence Regarding These Devotional Principles. So in this chapter we read today, uh, Rupa Goswami listed the devotional practices, and now we're going to find out 
the evidence behind them, you know, why did he list them? And he's going to cite different scriptures or different historical incidences to prove that. So this is Krishna consciousness. Anyway, okay, so now we will take some questions about some of these items or the topics of tonight's discussion. Hold on a second. Let me unmute you. You are now officially unmuted. Gopal had a question first. He sent me, he raised his hand while everybody else was sleeping. So what is the question? Thank you, Gurudev. Um, earlier, one of the Oops, items I was can't hear you. associated. That's probably my fault. Say something now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you, Gurudev. So earlier, one of the items was to associate with those devotees who are considered to be more advanced. Yes. So could could you elaborate on considered to be? That means who you consider to be <laughs> more advanced or others consider to be more advanced based upon uh, the different mm, uh, symptoms. Like yeah, there are symptoms by which you can determine whether someone is advanced or not advanced. I mean, of course, you cannot determine whether someone is a Mahabhagwat or not just by looking at them. Uh, but symptoms such as Shokshiyam uh, Brahmanishtam, such as someone who has heard nicely from his spiritual master and is an obedient servant of his spiritual master. If someone is not an obedient servant of his spiritual master, what does that mean for Prabhupada's disciples? That means Prabhupada's disciples who are serving Prabhupada's mission, that's what it means to be an obedient servant of Srila Prabhupada. So that's one of the qualities. And then also, you know, there's the quality of nishta, which we've been talking about in Bhagavatam class uh, yesterday. We talked about that quality. That means being steady. Someone who is steady doesn't deviate from Krishna consciousness. Uh, and let's see. That's it. You know, someone who's steady, uh, someone who is... Uh, steady in their sadhana, and also exhibiting Vaishnava qualities outside of their sadhana, in other words, during their interactions with other people. So there's many symptoms listed. Tadikshava, Kurumita, someone who is tolerant, merciful, uh, a friend to all living entities, doesn't have anyone as his enemy. Tadikshava, Kurumita, Surada, Saravidei, Namigata, Satyavashanda. These qualities can be observed externally. It's not that difficult to observe them externally. However, when we go to the higher realms of bhakti, you may not know. Like if uh, you were to approach one of these great abhadutas uh, who are pure devotees, of, let's say, pure devotees of the Lord, let's say Lord Rishavadev, for example, you would not know that he was a pure devotee. He's a Shaktivashavata, actually. He's not Krishna himself, but he's a Shaktabha Shabbatar. So you would not know that. Sometimes pure devotees are covered. They don't reveal themselves to others. So you don't, re you, you don't try to guess. You know, someone may say, I am a gopi. I realized I'm Chandravali in the spiritual world or something like that. Or I really... That's not, that's not necessarily a symptom. I mean, if someone talks about it, then it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean they are or they're not. I'm not going to criticize anyone right now, unfortunately. It just means that you can't tell. You can't tell. I'm always thinking of Krishna. How do you know? Maybe I'm thinking of Donald Trump some part of the day. So anyway, so uh, you can't really tell in the, when you're talking about the higher realms of bhakti, but at least you could tell whether someone is steady, dedicated to their spiritual master. And that's really the point. Prabhupada, in the Nectar of Instruction, defined the Mahabhagwat as someone who doesn't fall down and someone who's always thinking of spreading the Krishna consciousness movement. So I think these are primary qualities, you know, by which you can ascertain whether that person is more advanced. You should seek their association. Okay? All right. Uh, it's from Gopal, and, and Pranesha took a hint from Gopal. 
And he raised his hand too. You know, so people are being proactive here. Pretty interesting. Okay, Praneshra, congratulations. Yes. So, uh, Gurudev, my question is like intimate, intimate association and normal association in work. Yeah. So, like, we are like association with non devotees, and also in the work, we are getting association with the people who are not devotees. And, and we have the intimate association with devotees in the in the temple so yeah. how to how to protect self in in work and also in the association of non devotees well I, I i don't like to think of you know my platform of devotional service whatever platform or not i don't like to think of people as devotees and non devotees but for the rest of you i i see everybody as devotees or aspiring devotees, uh, or they've just forgotten that they're devotees. So I see everybody as a devotee. So anyway, as far as you're concerned, <laughs> that's funny. As far as you're, <laughs> as, as far as you're concerned, you should see everybody as aspiring devotees. You know, they've just forgotten what they are. I don't, I personally don't like the distinction of non-devotees, devotees, it's sort of it's a little painful for me. I mean, I could look at I could look at an ant and think that that person is a devotee. They've just forgotten. So anyway, I would say avoid the association of those who are actually blasphemous. And interact with less advanced devotees in a very compassionate way and interact with equally advanced devotees by making intimate friendships with them. Because even amongst devotees, if we have devotees who are less advanced than us, of course, if I'm humble, I will actually think that everybody is more advanced than me, but that's another thing, because I'm not humble, so it's not, not a problem that I have. So anyways, <laughs> but I have to be practical, too, you know, I can see. I can see who's a neophyte, I can see who's a Madhimadikari, I can see who's an Uttamadikari. So, uh, so anyway, so we don't, we don't, even if someone's less advanced, you know, we don't reveal our minds. When we're talking about intimate association, it means revealing our innermost hopes and expectations uh, to someone. I mean, that can be a little dangerous. Like if I was to go to my mother, who I love very much, and I was saying, mother, uh, no, this is not true, but if I was saying, mother, I, I really admire. My mother would say, wow, that's great. She wouldn't say that now, but anyway. She would have, she would have said that 50 years ago. So that's great. Uh, or if I went to my father and said, Dad, you know, I'm just having some doubts about Krishna. I think, you know, I need to have, I need to do something practical in this world. He would say, son, finally you're realizing what I've been telling you all along. Join me and become a dry cleaner. Anyway. <laughs> Sometimes when we reveal our minds to people, uh, when it's not appropriate, it can actually destroy relationships. I'll tell you something I've realized lately that hopefully you can make some people very upset. Hopefully. So anyway, I've really, uh, dealing with a lot of people, both devotees and people who are not full devotees yet, or people who are outside the Christian conscious movement, I've seen many marriages break up. And in 80% of the cases, it's at least, it's obvious, it's due to the mother-in-law because the wife keeps revealing her mind to the mother-in-law. Anyway, sorry about that. If I'm offending anybody's mother-in-law here, like that. And, you know, because, anyway, because the mother, anyway, I'm not going to go on with it. But so, so, so you have to be careful. Probably ha I'll lose half of you tomorrow from this, this class. So you have to be careful who you actually reveal your mind to, because if people are not happy with your being Krishna conscious or happy in the case of a marriage with you being married to someone, they'll play on that. 
And when they play on that, that can cause a disaster in your life, both materially and spiritually. Anyway, I'm not against mothers-in-laws, don't worry. Some of them are my best friends. Anyway, so... <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> so, uh... Anyway, we've got to add some humor to the class, just so you can understand. The main thing is, we reveal our minds and form intimate relationships when it helps us in devotional service. That's really the principle behind the whole thing. If it helps us, the intimate, you know, everything should be based on accepting things favorable, rejecting things unfavorable for Krishna consciousness. So if something helps us, that's wonderful. Be Krishna conscious. That's all. So don't worry so much. We should love everybody. I don't see people as devotees or non-devotees. I just see people as uh, aspiring to be devotees, but they don't know yet. And devotees, more advanced devotees like that. Don't worry, Praneshra. Just worship Giriraj. Yes. You'll be married soon enough. Don't worry. What is it, 30th, 30th of November you're getting married? Uh, yeah, yes, true. The, just schedule, but we have not fixed the place yet. Yeah, I'll attend by Zoom. Yeah, so we do, we plan to perform all this ceremony in Govardhan. That's nice. So, yes. and we also really want cool. to a very small ceremony and the very less people. Around, yeah, around eighty to hundred people will be uh, assembled there. So, eighty to hundred. We also a little bit worried yeah. about coronavirus. You said eighty to hundred or eighty to a hundred. Eighty to hundred. No, eighty to a hundred. Because if you say any 200, that's 8,200. That's one of the big ceremonies of the year. 8,200. 80 to 100. Max. Yes. Okay, congratulations. Who else has a question? Whoops. Oh, my phone is going to talk. I don't me. understand. My phone just talked to me. So any, anybody else have a question? Or comment. Anyway, the main I point, I didn't, more... I didn't want to get on the case of mothers-in-laws. The main point is you just don't reveal your mind to someone who will, when it will take you away from Krishna consciousness. That's the principle. That's the principle. And if your mother-in-law is going to bring you to Krishna consciousness, reveal your mind to her. So it's not, you'll have to excuse my bias. It's just whatever helps your Krishna consciousness. And having loving relationships, and especially if one's married, then the husband and wife should have a loving relationship and not let anyone else come in between them. That's really important. No one else should come between a husband and a wife. It's ridiculous. And so no one else should come between us and Krishna. That's the main point. No one. We should not allow it. Okay. On that happy note. <laughs> Any other questions? Hare Krishna Gurudev. This is Sumukha, your disciple. Sumukha, okay. Pranam, Guru. Yes. Uh, this is a small question. Uh, in, yeah. During during the uh, Mangalarti, after Samsara Dava, then we have uh, nursing prayer, then we have Tulsi Puja. But the altar closes just after the nursing prayer. Then we go in the altar and do start doing a deity worship. Then we leave yeah. the Tulsi Puja behind. We don't attend the Tulsi Puja. So uh, we think that, I think that the Krishna is waiting, so I have to be in the altar on time. That's right. So, would, okay, so later on, when you, come at, when you come out, take some water and water Tulsi. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's the essential. The essential item is not that you have to attend the whole 
Tulsi Puja song, although it's very nice. But they, you have to, every day you should have some, uh, you should take a spoonful of water and water Tulsi. That's the principle. So, you know, later on, after you agree to the deities and everything like that, then you, you're out there in the temple room and you circumambulate three times around Tulsi. Okay. Thanks for clarification. Okay. Any other questions? May I ask about one more of the items? Yeah. Could you expound a little more on not neglecting one's ordinary duties? In other words, you should be honest, you should make friends with everybody, you should be a perfect gentleman or a perfect lady. You should carry out your obligations uh, unless they're contrary to Krishna consciousness. You know, all, all sorts of things. Of course, you know, obviously you don't have to worship the demigods, like Prabhupada said in the previous chapter, or Rupa Goswami said in the previous chapters, that we don't have obligations to demigods or the forefathers or anything like that uh, anymore. All these obligations are taken care of. But if we're in a society where people do these different ceremonies, we do them because we're acting as perfect gentlemen and perfect ladies. So we, we carry out in society whatever is culture, excuse me, whatever is culturally appropriate. That means ordinary dealings means in each society, culturally appropriate things are there. Like before the COVID virus, it was culturally appropriate to shake people's hands, right? Now you don't do it. Thank God. Thank God for the COVID virus. Anyways, <laughs> now we can just go namaste, you know, which is kind of cool. But uh, so, yeah, so it's culturally appropriate. That's all. Just be culturally appropriate when you're dealing with people. And be honest, forthright, follow the law, be nice to people, uh, be hospitable, all these things. Don't be neglectful just because you're a devotee or trying to be a devotee. Okay. So previous to COVID, previous to COVID, and very likely after uh, COVID becomes, you know, more in the background, it was very common for people who work in a work environment, especially a corporate work environment, that they would be expected to attend events, parties, and so forth, where they would be yeah. expected to behave socially with their coworkers. Yes. So, so uh, under under those circumstances. So sometimes principles can be, um, you know, compromised. We've well, that's not a compromise with principle to act socially. You know, I was like, I think Prabhupada was greeted one time by the, what was it, the uh, vice governor of Paris or something like that. And you see Prabhupada standing around holding some hors d'oeuvres, you know, vegetarian hors d'oeuvres and talking to them and acting socially and chit chatting with them. So it's not against the principles. We should do that. Because otherwise people will think we are weird. We may be weird, but we don't want people to think it. <laughs> you know, why should people understand who we actually are? So, uh, no, we, we're regular people. Actually, many times people say about me, and I take that as as uh, praising. They say, hey, you're a regular person. Because when people meet me, you know, when they think of position and everything like that, they, they become a little frightened. They say, oh my God, is one of those monks or something like that. But when they find out, you know, just a regular person and I have regular conversations and regular relationships, what's wrong with that? I think it's good. We have to integrate in society. And Prabhupada certainly did this. Prabhupada had friends. Even that Mr. Uh, uh, Patel that I mentioned before, Dr. Patel, actually, he was Prabhupada's friend. Prabhupada kept, said he's my friend. Prabhupada was always asking about him. And Prabhupada liked him. Prabhupada loved him. So Prabhupada had friends, even though Prabhupada was arguing and screaming. <laughs> but it was like the interaction between two friends, and even though the guy was a Maya body. So Prabhupada had so many friends. Probably, I, probably I actually had a friend in New York when he first came. I think he was a janitor or something like that. He was one of Prabhupada's friends. So, yeah, we should be friendly with everyone. We should love everybody. 
It's just the question of, you know, when to reveal our minds and when not to reveal the minds. That's the whole thing about intimacy. And obviously, you don't want to go to a marijuana party. You know, you can go to your office party if you have to, but if you're friends at the university, if you join a sorority or something like that, and they're just getting intoxicated, well, why should you do something like that? It's going to contaminate your mind. I remember when I first went to the university, uh, the different fraternities were trying to court me. They were trying to get me to join. And one fraternity, I mean, it was so obscene. One fraternity, uh, I, you know, I'll tell you two fraternities. One fraternity, they actually had, uh, they actually had uh, dressed up like undertakers, like, you know, like morticians. And their party, they had a party, they put people in coffins and they marched out as part of the uh, homecoming parade. And they would have like girls jump out of the coffins. That was their, that was their experience of uh, pleasure. Another, another one would, would another uh, fraternity that I visited talked about how they would drink a whole keg of beer. Another one would have girls jump out of birthday cakes, you know, or whatever cakes. It's also degraded. I mean, in those cases, you don't have any social obligations. I mean, that's contaminated. But if you're working for a particular corporation, and then you bring some prashadam with you. You distribute some prashadam. People will appreciate. Whoops. So, just got a message on my watch. It's time to go. Actually, uh, okay. Okay, I think I answered all the questions. So tomorrow night, we'll continue with the next chapter, Chapter 7 in Nectar Devotion. Thank you all for joining us. It's good to see all you happy Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. And thank you for tolerating me, some of my explanations. <laughs> all glories to Zabai Grace, Shilaprabhupada, Shilaprabhupada, Ki Jai.